Jesus, you are all I ever need. Hi, everybody. I want to begin today with this. This year, we rang in the new year with a prayer call. And on that prayer call at midnight, uh, New York time, we all got together on the phone and we praised God for a good 45 minutes. We just rang in the new year praising God. And I think it just set a tone for the rest of the year. And I believe um, that something inside of me has just been ever since then been like it's like the Holy Spirit encouraging me to really believe for more this year to to expect more and to and to really see more now I I think this is what God wants from all of us always to grow that we can represent him better that we can um, show him off and I just want to show God off this year but this is the word I got this morning and it's from John 1 50 and it says Jesus answered and said to them do do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree he's talking to Nathaniel and Philip you will see greater things than these <clears throat> when I read this this morning something inside me said it's time for us to see greater things and we're gonna see greater things when we start expecting greater things you know I've been declaring things over my my children and this morning God's saying start declaring big and not just barely making it not just normal stuff but big stuff this morning Kate said on our prayer call do what you're famous for Lord there's a song out there that says you know do what you're famous for and she goes we were praying for someone said just do what you do Lord do what you do God wants to do what he does and he wants to do it through us and he can't do it unless we're cooperating, unless we are one with him. He wants us to show him off. So the next scripture is John 14. John 14, 12 through 14 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone, this is Jesus talking, anyone who believes in me will do the works that I have done and even greater works because I'm going to the Father and whatever you ask me in my name I will do so that the Son may glorify the Father ask me anything in my name and I will do it you know this word has been part of my life for 30 years now the first time I heard it was 30 years ago and I still blows me away every time I read it God wants to do the same things he did when he walked on this earth, but even greater. And he goes, I can do much greater things because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask me in my name, I will do. Oh my gosh, he wants to touch everyone on the whole planet, and he can do that only through us. The next scripture is John 7. This is verse, I think, 36 and 37. It says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and exclaimed, Let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. (coughs) Excuse me. And whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Jesus is talking about, it goes on to say, he's talking about the spirit, which no one has yet received because he's yet to be glorified it's not until Jesus goes to heaven that he sends the Holy Spirit and he's saying oh be prepared because rivers of living water are going to come out of you to nourish a dry and thirsty world on the last and greatest day of the feast Jesus stood up and exclaimed let anyone who thirsts come to me to drink whoever believes in me rivers of living water will flow from within him that's you and me God, Jesus is saying, rivers of living water will flow from within you. I believe we're going to to extend our tent pegs, as the word says. We're going to extend our authority, extend our influence, extend um, our reach. You know, maybe our reach has been real small because we're not treading into the deep water, but we're going into deep water this year. This is the year we stop. Try, we start going where we can't touch the bottom. We're going to go where our feet fail us so that we have to trust in God. We're going to do the impossible to represent God because 
If we just ask for things that are possible in the natural, there's no glory for God in that. God wants us to really step out. Last scripture is Acts 1. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> You'll know it if you have. Have you encountered the Holy Spirit like they did at Pentecost? Because that's, that's the encounter that's waiting for you. God wants you to experience that baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you will receive, Jesus said this before he was ascended, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. A grocery store by my house. And there was just myself and a man in front of me. And um, he was taking a while and I was getting a little impatient. Finally, he checked out and he turned around and his face was right up to my face. And I looked at him and I said, you're the golfer. And he says to me, I used to be, I used to be. I couldn't remember his name. And as he's passing, I remembered his wife's name. You know, the Holy Spirit will be, bring remembrance to your brain. So I said, oh, Barbara, your wife, how is she? I was on a committee with her. I just really, really like her. And he said, um, I like her too. She's, she's doing fine. So as he left, then the name came to me. And the whole Italian family that owns the store looked at me and I said, you don't know who he is. He's Jack Nicholas. He's the best golfer ever. I mean, he does a lot of charity work. They have uh, children's foundations and hospitals and just a wonderful man. So then I went into my car after I checked out. And I had the sinking feeling. He said he used to be. He used to be. He's probably retired maybe 10 years or so. And I thought, oh, that's terrible that he thinks about himself that way. And I said, Lord, if I ever get the chance to meet him, I would love to tell him how great he is. So fast forward to a couple of weeks ago, I went in for my uh, yearly mammogram and I come out and there he is in the waiting room by himself. And again, I can't remember his name. And I come, <laughs> go up to him. He's looking at me and I go, you're the golfer. And he goes, well, I used to be, I used to be. And I said, you know, you told me they have in the Italian store. You are the best golfer ever, ever, ever. And then I felt the anointing come on me. I made the sign of the cross over him and I said, and Jesus loves you. And I started to walk out and he said, thank you. So in 2022, are some of us really feeling that we are used to be? Because we're not. We're children of the living God, sons and daughters of the King of Kings. Isaiah says that he has new things for us. He says that Isaiah says that he will open doors that no man can close. That's what he's going to do for us this year. I'm going to be 75 shortly. When I was 70, I went on my first mission trip. My daughter-in-law called me from Minnesota and said, mom, would you like to go on a mission trip with me? And I said, oh, yes, honey, I would love to. Knowing that I'm 70 years old and I'm thinking, God, are you kidding me? As soon as I hung up, I said that to him. But I went to Haiti with her and her church. And I knew she wouldn't go if, she, if I didn't go with her because she didn't know anyone. And I made great friends with the young people that were on the trip. It was a hard trip. It was hot there. You know, the kids were starving and they were all over us and we had to bring water to the people, but it was beautiful. And the leader said to me, she said, Lorraine, I have no idea why I even let you come on this trip. We didn't know you. You weren't part of the, of the church at all. And we hardly knew Tracy. See, God will open doors that no man can close. Just trust in him. And one more short story. The other day I was at the driving range because I am a golfer. And this Jewish man, we have probably 80% of my community community is uh, Jewish here. He calls me over. And lately, he's been watching Joel Osteen. So he call, calls me over and he says, Lorraine, I want to tell you what Joel just had to say. Uh, you know, I just flick around and he just happens to be on the phone, on the TV. And I go, oh, okay, fine. So he says, this is what he said today. He said, when you're going down the road and you have the GPS on and you're going straight and all of a sudden you make a wrong turn. The GPS says, recalibrate. That's what we need to do in our lives. We all fall short of the glory of God, all of us. But as soon as we turn back to Christ, we are forgiven. We can align ourselves with him just like we align our cars and be on that narrow path with him. And it is, it is narrow, but it is so much fun. We will rejoice with him. He will show us the way every day because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody goes to the Father but through him. 
Amen. <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you, Lorraine. Preach it, sister. <laughs> I want to introduce Peter Herbick, who was so gracious to come on this call. And thank you. It took you. It took a couple months to get you here. Finally, his schedule is so busy. I just thank you for making us a priority. I really appreciate you. I have to say, and I've said this in all the emails I've sent out to all you all to get you here. This is one of the most um, amazing men that I've ever heard speak in the Catholic Church. He's, he's so dynamic. So if you can get to wherever he's speaking, I encourage you to to go. I may even have to go to. Florida. So um, Peter is Vice President and Director of Missions for Renewal Ministries. Okay, that's all I have. <laughs> the rest Great. is... The that's rest all you is need. Okay, good. Sinner and Friend of God is also there too. Sinner Edwards. and Friend of God. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yes, uh, Lorraine, thank you for your inspiring words. Uh, thank you. Praying over the golden bear. They call him the golden bear, you know, right? <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's good. Um, it's a delight to be able to be with you. And I just share a little bit more about myself. I'm, uh, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm married to a lovely woman named Debbie. Debbie is a Jewish convert to the faith. Um, she, we have four children and nine grandchildren, or 10, one on the way. Um, we brought them all together here, four families, brought them all together here for Christmas had wonderful plans uh, for the time. And uh, one of the boys, one of the little boys got sick on the flight here, uh, got sick and threw up in a plane. And then another family, one of the boys got the croup and, and got, the, got a fever and the whole family got wiped out for weeks. So we had families in town, but they didn't have a chance to meet each other because everybody had the flu. And, and the moms all wanted to keep the kids away to try to keep those who didn't have the flu to not get the flu. So it was musical chairs for a week and it was, it was fun, but it was a good time. It was good to see everybody. And um, yeah, it's, it was blessed time to be with the Lord. And so, uh, yeah, and I, I've been working uh, for the, since really 1990 uh, in partnership with Ralph Martin and, um, and Sister Ann Shields. The three of us kind of started this ministry, Renewal Ministries, and we focus on the promotion of renewal and evangelization, uh, really the, the promotion of the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, discipleship, healing, deliverance, freedom, all, all around the world. We do it through TV, radio, parish missions, priest convocations, and do a lot of international missions. We've kind of been grounded here because of COVID the last year and a half. We've been doing, on average, maybe 40 international missions a year in about 35 different countries, working with bishops, priests, and lay people in those countries, doing the kind of things I was just describing and helping them. And so we're slowly kind of unfolding now again we've got maybe i've got maybe a half a dozen missions in over the last few months but it's it's a different animal going out you know you when people come out on teams now one of the things you have to do is you have to count the cost of the possibility of when you're on the plane returning from papua new guinea or whatever and you get there for your test and you test positive you've got to you've got to stay in the country you know for a period of time and you can't get on the plane so you have to have you have to have all kinds of contingency plans to make sure they have a place to stay and they have enough money. Someone's going to care for them and the team leader is going to stay, but just all kinds of more complicated things are happening now with the mission as a whole. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, and, and my wife, Debbie, leads a very dynamic ministry called the Be Love Revolution for young women, high school age girls, BLR, they call it. Uh, be His, Be Free, Be Love is kind of their, is their motto. And uh, she's been doing running camps for about 30 years. And uh, she's got college girls mentoring high school girls, young married women mentoring, you know, um, young single girls. And then they're also down to the junior high level, just because she said, you, we have to start earlier with these girls, the, the, amount of, the amount of stuff that's coming at them. And this crazy thing here, you know, this crazy thing here, you know, TikTok and Instagram and stuff like that is consuming the lives of, of you know, kids in general. But Little girls are getting, are just tied into this at a very early age. It's very destructive, <clears throat> but she's had a lot of, a lot of blessings. Excuse me. I'm just getting over um, a, a cold and cough that I had during the time my kids were here. <clears throat> right after Christmas, I was speaking at the Encounter Conference. You guys know Encounter Ministries with uh, Father Matthias Dalen and Patrick in, at Grand Rapids, Michigan. They had their annual meeting oh, yes, and had sir. about four, 
they had about 4,000 people there. And it was, uh, it was fantastic time. And, um, uh, but when I got, got up to give my talk, I started speaking and uh, words did not come out of my mouth because my throat was at its worst at that point. I mean, I felt great otherwise, but I had this thing. <clears throat> and then uh, the Lord came and helped and made it through. But uh, one of the things I wanted to say today, um, <clears throat> if, uh, if I could, was something happened there at the conference uh, from the Lord. It's interesting. I'm starting to call. I haven't, I haven't had this for two days now. <clears throat> I'm going to take a little something to drink. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Heal him. Amen. Thank you for yeah. the night. <clears throat> but um, during adoration, I got to do radio shows after this too. <clears throat> um, uh, Father Matthias is carrying the Blessed Sacrament around. Uh, it was beautiful worship. And Father uh, Mike Schmitz was there and he was just kind of leading through a meditation on bringing everything to the feet of Jesus. And I, and just as he was saying that, I'd felt uh, the spirit of God come on me. I was just sitting by myself out kind of toward the back. And it was one of those times where you could just almost see the blank. You could just see the weight of God's glory coming down on the place and just being on top. And, and of course, when God does that, he's doing things with differently with people all over the room. It's kind of a harmony, but he's touching. He knows everybody by name. He wow. knows every hair on their head and he's doing his thing, you know? And it's, it's overwhelming when you see it's so beautiful to see it. And uh, but then um, the Lord said to me, Peter, I want you to tell them, meaning kind of everybody I speak to, uh, that uh, he wants everybody to lay down their unforgiveness, their fear, their anger, their rage, the storms that are raging in our culture. And it's in the church and the divisions. <laughs> And all of that that's there and to understand uh, what he's doing in the world is uh, one of the things he's doing is purifying his church and the purification he's bringing to his church is to strip her of these things and help bring her into a place of freedom. And, uh, and I, I always felt the Lord weeping and saying, Peter, I don't hate anybody, you know, and I want my bride. I don't have a human being on the earth. That's my enemy. And uh, I want my bride to love those who hate them and to pray for those who persecute them. And I felt like you said, as I, as I look at those who bear my baptism, um, right now there's just so much that the Lord's allowing to surface in the human heart that's there. That's part of what's coming up to the surface in people. And Jesus is saying, I want people, I want you to help people see it so they can bring it to me, and repent of it and put it at my feet because I want to give them a new heart. I really want to give them a new heart because he's preparing us for, um, honestly, my honest belief, the, the, all the prophetic stuff we've heard for years, uh, one of the greatest revivals the world's ever seen. But the Lord is positioning his church. He's preparing his church to enable his church to be his servant in love in that moment. And some people are on the front end of this already, you know, some people are moving in this already, but very large parts of the body of Christ, Catholic church in particular, but others aren't, they're not positioned. And the Lord is allowing this time of great shaking of, of the nations and the stress that's on the nations, the shaking and purification of the church itself you know, the, the judgment of God is in the nations, his loving discipline, his loving work is in the church, and um, shaking the world so the world releases its, its clinging to idols, <clears throat> but the church herself coming under the peaceful fruit of righteousness in the Lord and having our hearts renewed, and the father is, the vine dresser is, he's cutting off dead wood in the church, that's what the father, part of what the father's doing. Jesus wants to draw people who want to abide in him so he can bear fruit through them. And he's intending to do that. And he's going to do that. And, uh, but the father's cutting off dead branches because he doesn't, it's extremely unhealthy for people to live in the church on their own terms in a way that's not pleasing to the Lord. And the, and the preaching of the gospel and the prophetic word in the church is not very strong for the pulpit in the right kind of way. So it doesn't purify people's hearts. It doesn't bring conviction and exhortation, you know? And so, so the father's 
cutting off dead branches. So a lot of people said, you know, man, there people are leaving the church and all this. They're supposed to leave the church now in this sense, meaning it's not healthy for them. It's not healthy for the church, for them to be in the church sort of confidently and boldly. I'm here on my terms the way I want to be because the Lord is purifying a church and it doesn't have to be a big church right now to get to where he's going to go because it's all going to be his glory anyway. He's going to reveal his glory in a, in a magnificent way in the world. He's going to, he's exposing the work of the enemy right now in, a, in an incredible father. Consul Mesa put it this way. I ran across something he said a number of years ago that I think is right on. Cardinal Cantal Mesa, he said that the devil's intensifying his attack on the church, and he's exposing, he's playing his whole hand. He's going after all the big stuff because he smells something. He's trying to prevent something from happening, and that is a revelation of the glory of Jesus and a, and a prophetic fulfillment that the Lord has promised of the greatest revival the world has ever seen, and it's going to be in from a that God loves to, he doesn't need us for it, but he loves to bring us into it with him. And uh, he's searching the earth and he's doing his work to, to bring people's hearts aligned there. And so I was just thinking as I was, I was laying, basically kneeling on the floor there in the, in the auditorium and just the Lord just saying um, that the, we need to help people come out of these storms and these of, of division and anger and rage and confusion and unplug. Even people, even people who are walking with the Lord are getting trapped in these things. And they spend their days watching stuff, getting angsty about stuff, arguing about stuff, polarizing in the church, speaking negative words, speaking unbelief, filled with anger, unforgiveness, confusion, and, and they go to bed anxious, you know? And, um, so the Lord wants to deal with that. And so we, we're people like us, we're in position of, pe of people and we can sometimes be tempted to that ourselves, you know, but there's, we have to help people come out of that. It's really important to the Lord and it's really, really high on his priority list that his bride learn to love like he does with the compassion that he has with the tenderness that he has and a heart that has no enemies or fear of people who don't like me. You know, he wants to help us get over fear and the fear of being canceled or rejected or, or hurt or whatever, and just have his heart because we understand, uh, we understand we're in his hands and we understand what he's doing. Could I read just a couple simple prophetic words that maybe you've heard over the years that I think are, are really helpful along the lines of what I'm describing? Maybe you've heard these already. Um, you know, 1980, Father Michael Scanlon, you guys all remember Father Michael Scanlon, anybody from Franciscan University of Steubenville, President Franciscan, one of the great, great leaders uh, in uh, the move of the spirit in this generation, one of the real pioneers and patriarchs. And he said this, the Lord says, hear my word, the time that has been marked by my blessings and gifts is being replaced by a period marked by my judgment and purification. What I have not accomplished with the blessing and gifts, I will accomplish now by judgment and purification. My people, my church is desperately in need of this judgment. They have continued an adulterous relationship with the spirit of the world, and I come to purify them. So the time has now come upon all, a time of judgment and purification. Sin will be called sin, and Satan will be unmasked. What has not been accomplished by the, in this baptism and the flooding of the gifts of my spirit will be accomplished in a baptism of fire. So it's like the kindness and severity of God. You know what I mean? That Paul talks about. And so there's a dimension of, of Christianity, of baptized people to start with, who, ne who just refuse to respond to the move of God in the last 50, 60 years in the world. It's amazing. They don't even want to recognize it. You know, 500 million people have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit around the world, you know? Tens of thousands of Muslims are having dreams and all kinds of people just like, who cares? They don't care. This is God's grace. God is moving, and there's a whole set of people who are stamped with baptism or go to church who just aren't even interested, right? Wow. And so what the Lord has to do, he has to, as a loving father, is to turn up the heat to unsettle people's lives. Because you know, when human, especially in a country like ours, friends, we, we've had so much prosperity and comfort. I know I'm talking to an international crowd here, but the Western world, Malta's had lots of blessing over the years in other places. When human beings have the steady flow of money, of, of you know, comfort, 
of social order, of, uh, of plenty of entertainment. When all this stuff is coming and it's flowing, the Lord has a very hard time getting people's attention, especially their hearts, because their hearts are given to other things. And he loves them so much that he's going to do, he's going to keep, he's going to do the shaking that's necessary of the perfect loving God to awaken people to hear him because they're not hearing him. He wants not only to save them, he wants to draw them into his victory. Even though it's going to be all him, he wants us to be a part of it and to be instruments in it, you know, and it's already, it's already actually, that's already begun. So it's important for us to see that, I think, and to help people understand. So it's like Hebrews chapter 12, right? Uh, the writer of Hebrews describing, you know, God sh will shake the nations again. God shakes the nations to reveal to people the truth that they're clinging to what is shakable, idols, things they're leaning on that cannot give them life and strength, and they can't find their, you know, identity, and to shake them free to learn to cling to what's unshakable. So, uh, and then uh, the uh, <clears throat> Isaiah reminds us so clearly. Isaiah twenty six nine. When God's judgments are in the land, men learn righteousness. You know, but there's a, there's a way in which that word scares people. You know, but but it but it you have to understand it right in the context of who God is and what He's doing and what it means. God's not stomping around angry in heaven. He doesn't do that. That's not who He is. You know, but we experience it as a discipline, as a shaking, as a disruption. It's uh, it's like a Psalm 81, ladies. It's 11, guys, 11, Psalm 81, 11 through, four, through 13 or 12, excuse me. Um, God says, or starting in verse 10, I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide that I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel wouldn't, would have none of me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. And right now you can see our politics, our global politics. God has given us, oh, given them over to their own counsels because they're turning their back and there's so much foolishness and, and it's just crazy and deception and confusion. The Lord is exposing the emptiness of the idolatry of the self-worship that's at the center of it all, you know? And so the church is clinging, some of the church are clinging to that and desperately clinging, but the Lord is trying to shake us, shake them free from it. But he wants to bring us into that place of being peacefully ordered under his kingship and his lordship, you know. So one of the things, uh, another prophetic word that Ralph Martin gave in 75 in Rome, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this stuff, but in 1975, <clears throat> there was a very, very significant meeting at St. Peter's in Rome. Uh, it was the first meeting ever of the emerging Catholic charismatic renewal that was happening globally with the Pope. The move of the Spirit had already begun decades earlier across the world, the outpouring of baptism in the Spirit and these kinds of things. And it, But it was the first time there were less than a million people at that time involved in the movement on the Catholic side. And Ralph Martin was the key organizer of the event, but Pope Paul VI came. That's when he sat down and said, this is a grace of a new Pentecost. This is a chance for the people of God, you know? And then Ralph gave this prophecy. I mean, people were, you know, 10,000 people were in the church and they're just dancing and rejoicing. And yes, this is God, the Lord, you know, all that kind of stuff. And just the confirmation of walking in the Lord's grace and spirit. And then Ralph, <clears throat> after communion, gets up and prophesies this. He's only given like three prophecies his whole life, I think. But um, this is one, probably the most consistently discerned and understood. He says, because I love you, I want to show you what I'm doing in the world today. I want to prepare you for what is to come. Days of darkness are coming on the world and days of tribulation. I will lead you into the desert. I will strip you of everything that you're depending on now. So you depend just on me. A time of darkness is coming on the world, but a time of glory is coming for my church. And a time of glory is coming upon my people. I will pour out on you all the gifts of my spirit. I will prepare you for spiritual combat. I will prepare you for a time of evangelization the world has never seen. And when you have nothing but me, you will know you have everything. You know? And so it's that same, that same theme. And it can, this kind of understanding has come through all kinds of streams of Christianity over the last number, number of years, number of decades. 
And I, I really believe this is what we're in. If, and the reason I'm bringing it up, friends, is if we don't see it, um, especially when we've, we've, we've fed a lot in America on a kind of grace message that says, everything's got to work for me all the time. You know what I mean? Like, so if the money flow is not there, or this isn't there, God's not there. It's just, it's, it's not healthy. And, and the Lord has to help us kind of deal with that too. And so they, they don't have a hard time sort of connecting with, with what, what the Lord is saying. So I, what I see in it is, what I see unfolding is exactly what the Lord prophesied. I, I just am thrilled to be alive right now. I mean, it's just an overwhelmingly significant time to be alive. And yes, it doesn't matter how old you are. Ralph Martin's 79 years old. He's in San Diego <clears throat> giving, giving a retreat to, you know, a dozen priests from around the United States. I can't keep up with that guy. He's unbelievable, you know? And um, we, had a, we had an experience in, 20, in 2016. I was in Uganda uh, with the Archbishop of Latvia, a friend of mine. We were giving a retreat to about 400, 350, 400 priests, deacons, and bishops from around five, five East African countries. And um, I was having personally the biggest struggle I ever had on a mission in my life. I never, I'd never had anything quite like this, but it was only in me. And it was at night. I didn't sleep like almost three nights in a row. It was unbelievable. And I got some friends to pray unbound with me. And, uh, you know, it was very helpful. And it was a tormenting spirit that was just assigned to me. And I was trying to fight it. And uh, I needed help of the brethren. You know what I mean? And the help of the brethren came. And the Lord cleaned my house. And it was great. But I, I was, you know, literally I had gone a few days after flying through the night there. I went for a few days leading this whole thing and slept one hour a night, two nights in a row. It's all I did. And I was getting anxious, which I normally don't do. And I was, you know, and then I got prayed over. The Lord uh, delivered me. And right at, just so happened after that time of prayer, we had mass with everybody. And I was sitting down and just going through the service. And I felt, I said, Lord, I feel like I had a full night's sleep. This is so amazing. I felt totally refreshed. Praise so well, this is wild, you know? And um, I said, I just love you, Lord. And I just felt like a blessed young boy, you know, child of God. So I go to communion. I come back. I'm sitting down. And I'm just rejoicing in the Lord. He's so good, you know? And I felt like he said, get out your pen, you know, and your journal. So I got out my journal and I thought the Lord was going to say, you know, I, I still love you, son. You're special and something like that. You know, I love you all that. But as soon as I did, the fear of the Lord came on me in that beautiful way. When the healthy fear of the Lord comes that, you know, like, like Isaiah says, you know, that Jesus, the Messiah, his delight was in the fear of the Lord, you know, and, and that, and I was experiencing, and I felt like the Lord said, I'm rising from my throne. I'm coming to set my church free, and you're going to see this 2016. I felt like he said to me, I wrote it down just like this. Peter, you're going to see chaos, apostasy, rage, and confusion coming across the earth. And I'm going to allow basically the things we were talking about here earlier to happen. I mean, I hadn't had these things in mind at the time because it kind of came out of the blue. And, and he said... Um, I'm, I've given you an assignment as I've given others in the spirit an assignment. I want you to stay in your lane. I want them to stay in their lane because I'm going to use them now. I want you to encourage them. I want you to strengthen them in it. But I'm going to deliver my church from um, kinds of spiritual bondage that are crippling her that only he can deliver. And he said, the glory will be mine and I'm going to do it, you know. So go forward. And I just felt this tremendous surge of clarity and strength and grace. And so I, I just think the Lord has told his secrets to the prophets, like he said he was going to do, you know, and he gives, he wants us to be able to understand the meaning of what we're going through, you know, and to help people understand it so they can cooperate with it. You know, the Lord doesn't want anybody to miss what he's going to do. Anybody who bears his name to miss what he's going to do and their role and their place in it, you know, and I think right now there's such a blanket. I was talking to a, a leader on the East Coast on the phone the other day who's kind of supports our ministry and I was just thanking him. I said, what's happening in North Carolina, you know, and he said, <clears throat> he said, Peter, it's like a, an epidemic of fear is over people everywhere, you know, and, and, uh, I'm thinking about Jesus. 
Jesus saying so clearly to the apostles at that Last Supper discourse, John 13 through 17, you know, thinking, friends, of the dynamic of what was going on in that moment. Jesus is telling them he's going to go to the cross. Then Jesus is telling them they're going to be scattered. Then Jesus is telling them eventually in that Last Supper discourse about what's going to happen to their lives, you know, before they come home to the Lord, that they're going to, they're going to lay down their lives for him. And they're going to be despised and rejected and all this stuff. And then he talks to him in Matthew about what it's going to be like before he returns. It's like, whoa, you know, th those are the most dramatic, intense, um, you know, sharing from Jesus of the spiritual battle that's going to be on, going on in the earth. And what does he do? He looks at me, he says, but here's what I want you to know. I'm telling you, it's going to come. My grace is sufficient for you. He said, in this world, my brothers, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Nothing in this world can separate you from the purpose I have for you. And then thinking of my, uh, John 14, 1, same discourse, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's a command, you know, don't let them be troubled. And boy, are there a lot of troubled hearts out there right now. We have to help people to understand, but they're not, it's a sign when our heart is crippled by trouble, we're not accessing the power of God, the power of the spirit, the hope and life that's in the king, you know? And so he said, um, don't let your hearts be troubled, but believe in God, believe also in me and understand I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And I'm sending my spirit to you who, who will counsel you, who'll give you strength, and I'll never, I'll never be separated from you. So it's very interesting how clear and practical Jesus was to say to them, here's how you deal, brothers. Your tribulation's coming. Don't fear it because I've conquered it. It's only going to be temporary. Whatever it is, you know, it's going to be temporary. I'm in charge. No, I'm totally in charge. So that's number one. And now you're going to have troubled hearts when you see everything hitting the fan. Don't let it happen to you. I find that so encouraging because there's a decision there that can be made and needs to be made. We don't have to let the trouble and the disordered energy that's in the world the swirl of that disordered energy that the enemy is trying to trap us in and get us to discourage, to get caught up in that. We have to just resist it in the authority of the Lord and say, okay, and I'm going to obey Jesus. And then I'm, Jesus said, you know, believe in God. So trust the father. He's your father. Trust him completely and trust me too, you know? And then trust me because here's where I'm going. Here's how the plan is finishing. I'm actually preparing your room in my father's house. Don't worry about the big stuff. I mean, the big stuff's covered. And so the enemy wants you to think there is no big stuff for you in the future. And it's all darkness and death and hopelessness. It's not. So don't let the darkness in the moment steal the reality. Brings me back to Paul in Ephesians 1. A beautiful apostolic prayer where he says, um, <clears throat> he prays to the father that we would receive a revelation in the knowledge of the Son of God. That's what the baptism of the Spirit's about. That's why it's here. You know, that's the starting place for it. So that you would know this. You would know the hope that's in you. You'd know the inheritance that you've received and the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe. That's where he's taking us to. Clear experience in walking in hope, which produces amazing courage in human hearts when we're living in hope. Hope, understanding our inheritance that's in the saints. I mean, the saints even who are alive today that are, but I'm thinking also the saints in glory and how there's the victory that the saints have won in Christ that we know that that's our, that's our inheritance. The, the inheritance of what they've been given is what's in Jesus, the firstborn. It's for all of us who are baptized into him. We get a share of that glory now in faith, and the saints are in full glory now in home, at home, and this is what we received, and we've already begun to get it in the down payment of the Spirit, 
that's dwelling in us. So we live with that inheritance. We have a richness now. And when we have that hope, we have the confidence in the inheritance, we begin to, to believe in, as Paul says it, the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe. Here's a guy who was writing from prison, probably in chains, you know, in a miserable, miserable Roman prison. And he goes, oh, if they could just get and see what I see in faith, Father, uh, what, what you've shown us, Father. I pray, Father, that you reveal the majesty of Jesus to them, and these things will come alive in them, and they'll have all the strength they need. And they'll come to like this line Ralph is saying. Here's another way of saying it. And when you have nothing but me, you will know you have everything. Right? So um, it's, it's such a pregnant moment, friends. It's such a precious moment. The devil's strategy, of course, is to say, well, who are you? You're really too old, or you're not smart enough, or you're not influential enough, or you're not this, that, or the other thing. Uh, you know, he's got the storyline, uh, kind of what's ever there. And so let me end with just one thing. You ladies probably know this story. You know, the testimony of the woman from Colombia, Gloria Polo, you know her story? She was, uh, you can find it on the internet, on YouTube. I've never met her. But uh, she was a, a, a woman, a dentist, a very worldly woman into her body, into this, that, and the other thing, into men, into stuff, successful, career-driven. And she and her nephew were attending a conference. And in Bogota, they were walking out of the conference, and there was a thunderstorm. And they were walking through a puddle, and they got hit by a lightning bolt. And the, and the, uh, both of them were in the puddle being electrified. And the 26-year-old nephew died. Her, her husband got thrown out of the puddle, and she's in it. She ended up dying twice, went to heaven, had an examination of her life before the Lord. And the Lord, and she was charged so bad, sisters, because like her breasts were completely burned off. Her legs were completely charred. Her, her um, reproductive organs were completely fried because she was wearing an IUD and the um, had a wire running through it, and a thunderbolt conducted. I mean, the light that the that that cord that wire conducted the lightning. And um, she was a very worldly girl. And um, but God, the Lord saved her. There's a huge story. It's totally beautiful. But the reason I bring this up, the Lord said, "I'm gonna I'm I'm sending you back because you're gonna tell your story more than ten thousand times across the earth." And then what she has done, like. Uh, very humble. She's been totally healed. Every, every part of her body has been totally restored. They almost cut both her legs off, but her sister pled with the doctors not to do it. And she ended up having another child even, you know, God restored everything. But the Lord said, I want to show you why I'm sending you back. And he showed her the country of Colombia at night. And there were like candles burning in different parts of the country. And there was a big candle, big a big flame at the foot of Mount St. Martha. And she said, what is that, Lord? Who is that? And she said, these are the people. He said, these are the people, my people who cried out for you. And what's the big flame? The Lord showed her it was a simple farmer, a, a, a subsistence farmer who was a saint, basically, who radically loved the Lord. Who was whose son was kidnapped or almost kidnapped by the gorillas and they burned the little crops that he had. And the Lord showed him getting up for church early Sunday morning. He said, I want to show you this. She got she went through this thing on a Friday, I think. And Sunday morning, he's at church an hour before anybody's there. In his life, there's lots of trials and sufferings, and he is all dressed up in his suit. And he comes to church and he lays down on the floor. No one else is in the church yet. And he just whispered, he said, listen to him. And he's saying, Jesus, thank you. You're so good to me. I love you so much. Lord, I love you. And he gave, in Mass, he gave half of what little money he had. The other half, after Mass, he goes to buy some salt and I think some bread. They wrap it up and give it to him. They take it home. He's unfolding it. He's taking the bread out. And he sees it's the newspaper and her story's on the front page. So he sees it and he reads it and he starts to cry. And he says, Lord, save my little sister. Save my little sister. He doesn't know her from Adam, right? 
save her, Lord, save her. I'll walk, I'll do pilgrimage to the shrine at the other side of the country, Lord, if you spare her life. You know, he's crying out for her. And she was shocked as she was seeing it being played out in front of her. And she goes, Lord, tell me who he is. So when I go back, I can, I can say something to him. And you know what Jesus said? I'm not going to tell you who he is because I don't want you to steal his crown. His crown is great that awaits him. Isn't that amazing? I just was like, that is so God. It's such the Lord. And so she, every day after that, you know, she, she would do a holy hour before the blessed sacrament every day. I don't know, like a year later, whatever it was, she was praying and the spirit of God came on her and the Lord brought him right in front of her. The, the, the man, he was on his way home. He had died. And the Lord said, I'm bringing him home now. This is who he is, you know? And I'm saying that because this man was mighty, mighty in the kingdom of God. And no one knows him, right? And so we can easily disqualify ourselves. Like, I'm so old, I'm out of the game. I, I got no strength anymore. I did that, 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 that. Nobody even knows me. Nobody listens to me. Anything Amen. like, don't worry about it. It's the size of your heart, not the size of your footprint, the size of your love for the Lord and your unity with him. And the more you love and the more you give, the more he gives you to share in his glory in this work in the earth. And he's, he remembers all of it, all the little stuff, all the love, all the ways, right? And so it, we, it's important for us to keep that in our heart and understand that so that, you know, the liar, the enemy wants to disqualify us, to sideline us and silence us, you know? So, so good. So good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So anyway, it's, that, that's, those are all my thoughts for this morning, if that's okay.